Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. We're here. We're going to have a good time today. Uh, there's lots of uh, things that we have to praise the Lord for this morning, and uh, it's going to be a good time. So I just want to welcome you. Thank you for coming today. And uh, you'll notice that we have um, David and Beverly Sedlachuk visiting with us. They are our guest speakers today. You'll hear more about them a little later on, but we want to give a special welcome to them this morning. And um, I just want to highlight a couple of announcements. Uh, one, there will be mixed bowling coming up in October. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer on the board um, on the lower level. Please uh, sign up for that. That's coming in October. You'll have, hear more details in the future about that. And that's sponsored by Men's Ministries. I also want to highlight announcement number 13 in your bulletin. West Park Manor is celebrating 40 years uh, of being in our community. So uh, they're having an open house, and that will be on September 10th. And they also have a gala dinner event on September 18th. So we want you to put those in your calendar, attend if you can, and uh, support and celebrate uh, the presence of one of our nursing care homes here in our community for 40 years. That's wonderful. Also today, I, my final announcement this morning is going to be that we have a potluck lunch today. So for those of you who just didn't have a chance to get that dinner ready for today, please stay. You will not be disappointed. And I, I got to tell you, I came to the program last night, and um, I was really blessed. And I would encourage you to stay for the potluck and enjoy the seminars that will be happening this afternoon starting at 2 o'clock. So I, I really want to tell you, uh, you will be blessed. I was blessed. I was very excited um, after hearing the program last night and going home. And I'm just, I was, I, I woke up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. I was so excited about, you know, just the opportunity to learn more about God and being authentic and real in our relationships with him and with one another. So I want to encourage you to uh, stay for lunch today. God will multiply the food if you didn't bring any. Or you can pray that God will just fill your stomach where you don't feel that hungry. He will do it all for us. All right? Okay. I'm just going to share this um, psalm this morning. David was an excellent praiser. And we can learn so much from him. And I just want to share his words of praise in Psalm 100 this morning. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Amen. What a wonderful God we serve. That's the God that we're here to meet with today, and I'm asking you to stand and join us as we sing our call to worship a prayer, asking for this wonderful God to meet with us as we worship him today. Lord, we have come to this We. 
Lord, that is our prayer, that your presence would be experienced in this place today. Lord, we tell you now as a church family that we want and need more and more of you. We're not satisfied, Lord, with with what we've had so far, and we acknowledge that we've been the ones to limit you, Lord. And so, Lord, we're telling you now to not only meet us, but to fill us, that we might experience more and more of you, and that we might be transformed by that experience of you today. Father, we want to bring joy to your heart today as we worship you. We want you to feel good, Lord, because you hurt so much because of what goes on in this earth. And so thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to bring you some joy today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please can join us as we sing our opening hymn, number 249, Praise Him, Praise Him. possible if we can kneel for prayer. Father, you are such a good and marvelous God. And Father, we come here before you this morning to tell you that we love you. We thank you, Father, for waking us up this morning with a fresh breath of air. We thank you for bringing us here to worship you. And Father God, we know that some of our members weren't able to join us here this morning due to illness or due to other concerns. And so Father God, I pray that you may pour out a special blessing upon them this Sabbath day. I pray, Lord, that if it be possible where your will um, be, I pray that they may be healed. 
And Father, you know all the struggles and trials that we each go through. And Father, we are here to tell you that we leave them at the foot of the cross. And we ask, Lord, that you may take control. Father God, we praise you for the amazing decisions of baptism that are going to be happening here today, Lord. For Sean and Caesar, I pray a special prayer for them, Lord, that you may bless them abundantly. And Father, as we each witness this baptism, I pray, Lord, that it may be uh, a reminder of our decision for you that we've made. Lord, reignite our hearts for you. I pray, Lord, that this service may be glorifying to you. Be with the speakers here this morning that have traveled afar to bless us with what, the message that you have given them. I pray, Lord, that you may speak to them in a mighty way. And Father, we pray that you may open up our hearts, our minds, our ears, so that we may be receptive to the inclination of your spirit, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A wonderful thing happened uh, to me last week, and um, you know, I, I saw a miracle. Yeah. How many of you have seen a miracle? Do you know, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you about the miracle I saw last week. Last week I, uh, I heard one of our, our brethren was sick and uh, seriously ill. And then, and, and uh, he was ill Wednesday, and then it was Sabbath, last Sabbath, and then I saw this man walk into church. And I was like, but this is a miracle. And when I talked to this brother after, I knew for sure it was a miracle. And it just made me, and I was so happy to see this brother walk into church last week that I, the, the service was kind of over for me. I'm glad Pastor Peter's not here to hear me say that. I, I just, the service was kind of over for me. I was just like, God is so good. I just went zero to a million in praise to God because he is so good. And, um, and, then, and you know, Brother David, will you stand? Do you deal with? Think, this, this man is a miracle. You know, and I just wanted to take a moment this morning and acknowledge God's greatness. Because some, we, and this, what made me think, what happened to me last week was, because I was waiting for everything to stop. I was waiting for, you know, just something to happen, to just show that, you know, God had really done something incredible. And it didn't happen that way. And I'm... I was amazed at that. It made me wonder, how many miracles have I seen and not acknowledged? When, when um, I had asked David to do um, the, uh, actually the offering call, and um, I was uh, last week, and um, I, I learned on Wednesday that, that on Wednesday, he had had, that he had had a heart attack and so imagine me finding this out Friday night D before I'm thinking, like I'm just telling, I was just calling to see, like, you know, make sure everything was okay or just actually to let him know that he didn't have to do it. And then I get an email from his wife telling me, David had a heart attack and, you know, pray for him. And I was just, I was, I was shocked. And then when he walked into church, then I went, well, I went that's why I was so happy. Because I've never heard of somebody having a heart attack and then and, 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 uh, just walking around a couple days later like nothing happened. And, but I'll tell you, when I, when I went up to him after the service and I spoke to him, that's when I knew it was a miracle because he, what he told me he had been through, 90% of people um, die from this kind of heart attack. You have to be in the yard to survive it. He did none of that, but he survived it because we serve a marvelous God. 
I will give glory to God for that. And I just wanted to stop and just, like church, let us praise God. He's doing these things to encourage us. You know, we think our prayers aren't answered. Well, he's answering them and we don't even know he's answering them. How many times do we pray for help? And like this man's walking around, he didn't know he had a heart attack. He didn't know. I'm not even going to tell his story. You go and ask him his story. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm telling this at this time. This is worship through giving. We cannot outgive God. And if we realized what God did for us day to day, we, we probably wouldn't even have this in our service because if we did, the church would just be overflowing. We'd, we'd be so grateful about what God has done. We'd be just giving and giving and giving. But alas, this is, but we live in a sinful world and sometimes we're blind to what God is doing for us. So I just wanted to take a moment and open our eyes to at least one miracle that I know about. We need a, I think we need a time in our service where we just hear about what God has done for people so that we can all be encouraged. Right? It's, it's amazing to me. God is so alive. He's so powerful. And we just think of things as coincidence. Business as usual. And it, God is just amazing. He's doing stuff. And sometimes we're not seeing it. But isn't that how it was when Jesus was here? This special child, God, got dedicated in the temple. Nobody noticed. Anyway... I'm going to ask the ushers to stand. And as you think about what God has done for you, think about it. Think about what you can give back to God this morning. Give with an open, grateful heart of gratitude. And um, I just want to encourage us to remember that we can't outgive God. Today's offering is for the church budget, helps to support the various ministries of the church, the, helps us keep the lights on keep the seats padded, carpet on the ground, all of that kind of stuff. And we're just going to ask you to return to God, just some of what he's done for you. Father in heaven, please bless those who can give this morning and especially bless those who feel they can't give. And I just pray, Lord, that you will continue to pour out from heaven your blessings upon us, your people, even though we're unworthy, even though we're not perfect. And um, I just thank you that we don't have to be a certain way for us to get a blessing from you. Thank you for your many blessings. Be with us the rest of this day. May we be open. Open our eyes, Lord, to what you're doing to us for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Church family, hello church family, how are you doing today? It is truly a beautiful Sabbath day today, isn't it? It is especially beautiful because we have an opportunity to celebrate two amazing decisions for baptism this morning, amen? I'd like to invite Sean and his father Caesar up front here, come on forward. Right. If you haven't met these individuals, I encourage you to make sure you meet them because they are two amazing young individuals. This is um, Sean and his father, Caesar, and it has been such a privilege studying with these two individuals. In fact, I first started studying with Sean. Um, Jorge introduced me to you, and we met, and he said, I'd like to start some Bible studies. And so we started studying, and um, it was interesting because as we were going along, we, I started, and uh, his father was unfortunately unable to join us at the beginning, and I, I thought maybe he's a little bit skeptical at first, because I noticed we'd study, we'd come together, and uh, he'd go into the fridge one day while I was studying with Sean, and then the next week I'd come back, and next time he'd, he'd look a little deeper in that fridge to, to hear a little more about what we were discussing in our Bible studies. And praise God, uh, he started coming and he, he came forward and he said, you know, I, I'd like to join the study. And so we got him caught up, we gave him studies, and for the whole time the rest of that we were studying together. So it was by no co coincidence here this morning that these two individuals have decided to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. It is such a beautiful decision. And um, this morning I'd just like to share with you uh, Caesar's favorite text is Psalms chapter 91. It is very meaningful to him, and so I thought I'd just read it for us this morning. Psalms 91. It says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge my place of safety. He is my God and I am trusting Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with His wings. He will shelter you with His feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousands are dying around you, these evils will not touch you, but you will see it with your eyes. You will see how the wicked are punished if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter. No evil will conquer you. Amen. No plague will come near your dwelling, for he orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. You will trample down lions and poisonous snakes. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen. The Caesar has made this decision to follow Jesus and he longs for Jesus' protection. And he longs for his coming. Amen. Sean, his favorite text was in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. This text is important to him. So I'll read this, Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where they can be eaten by moths and get rusty, and where thieves break in and steal. It says, Store your treasures in heaven, where they will never become moth-eaten or rusty, and where they will be safe from thieves Wherever your treasure is, there your heart and thoughts will also be. And I just want to say that um, truly, Sean has made the decision to store his treasure up in heaven. He has changed his job because of the Sabbath, to follow the Sabbath, to be faithful to it. And so we praise God for those decisions. 
It says, your eye is a lamp for your body. A pure eye lets sunshine into your soul. But an evil eye shuts out the light and plunges you into darkness. If the light you think you have is really darkness, how deep that darkness will be. And, he, and it says, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I tell you, don't worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food, drink, and clothes. Doesn't life consist of more than food and clothing? Look at the birds. They don't need to plant or harvest or put food in barns because your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are far more valuable to Him than they are. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Of course not. So Sean is not worried. He knows his, his life is in God's hands. He says, and, and why worry about your clothes? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he more surely care for you? You have so little faith. So don't worry about having enough food or drink or clothing. Why be like the pagans who are deeply concerned about these things? Your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. And he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. And so, Sean and Caesar, I'd like to ask you both some questions here. Do you accept the death of Jesus to pay for your sin? I do, yes. 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 Wonderful. Do you believe that God gave you the Bible as the most important guidebook? Yes. yes. By God living in you, do you want to obey the Ten Commandments, which include the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Do you want to keep help as many people as possible to be ready for the soon coming of Jesus? Yes. Yes. Amen. Do you want to help as many people through your influence of effort and through money? Yes. Yes. Amen. Do you want to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and believe this church has a special message to give to the world? Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, you've heard it. These two individuals want to commit their lives to Jesus in front of you. And uh, how many in this church family here would want to see them a part of this family? Amen. You see, this is an extension of your family. And so I want to remind you to continue to pray for them. And actually, at this time, I'd like to invite all the elders forward. We're going to have a special prayer for these individuals. We're going to kneel down together. I'd like to invite all the elders to come on forward at this time. We'll have a nice special dedica dedication prayer. Father in heaven, what a joyous occasion this is to see two people accepting you in a public fashion. We know that even, even in the quietness of this place right now, that there is absolute joy in heaven because they've made a decision to serve you. Thank you so much for the power of your Holy Spirit that has been just working on uh, these two brothers. And, Thank you for the decision that uh, they have made to go with you all the way. Lord, I just pray for Caesar in a very special way. Thank you for all that you have done for him. You've brought him this far, and you will continue to, to lead him uh, in the path that you want him to go. Lord, just, um, uh, just bless him now. Let uh, everything that he does bring honor and glory to your name. And uh, I just ask that you just, uh, uh, just surround him with your love and uh, just place him in the palm of your hand and protect him from the evil one. We know that it's going to be tough. We know that there are things that will come through, but uh, you are better than any other situation that uh, the devil can throw at him. And I just ask that you just bless him now and uh, just um, let his life 
just be a beacon of light so that uh, people that come in contact with him sees that uh, he's different now, uh, that he's a follower of you. And uh, just bless him now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father in heaven, I want to take a minute to thank you for Sean. I pray, Lord, that you may continue to bless him for this decision that he's made. And Father, we know that sometimes it's difficult to um, stay true to you, but Father, we know that you can empower us. And Father, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father, I thank you for Caesar in a mighty way. I th pray that you may continue to speak to his heart, Lord, every single day. And Father, be with these two individuals in a mighty way as they've made this decision. We know, Lord, that Satan's going to attack, but we know that you are mighty, mighty God. And Satan has nothing on them. And so, Father God, I pray that your angels will put a hedge of protection around them. I pray, Lord, that each and every day they may be committed to you wholeheartedly. And, Father God, I pray for this congregation as we accept them into our arms of, of, of membership and, and family. I pray, Lord, that this church family will continue to uplift these individuals in their prayers, to support them, to be with them, to care for them through just a smile, through a phone call, through whatever way you may lead. And Father God, we pray for your blessing at this time. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we have some small gifts as a token of our appreciation, and our, our celebration with you, um, which we will actually also give to you after your baptism as well to, to hang on to, but there's a rose and uh, your certificate along with a book. And so we'll proceed to the back now and be baptized.
Pastor Peter, we love to start studying with you, prepare for your special day of baptism. Well, we're all witnessing. You've all witnessed another two miracles today. God is on a roll. He is. And if you don't think that that's a miracle, i got to tell you, God and all of heaven disagree. They're partying. Why aren't we? Let's, let's, let's choose to party. Because two souls decided that the devil isn't going to have a hold of them anymore. They've chosen to be on the winning side. And uh, let's sing this song of praise to God. We're grateful that he's chosen to save us. Let's sing. You did not wait for me to draw me.
quietly, and uh, he has a great story for you. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. How many of you like the part of our program called Children's Story? Do you like coming to Children's Story every... Good, good. Because I'm looking for some people to tell Children's Story in the future, so I might be calling on you someday soon. Now, do you know that every Sabbath, we actually have two stories up here? Did you know that? Oh, of course, you know about Children's Story, but the adults have a story, too. Now, they like to use fancy names like sermon or message or seminar, but don't kid yourself. It's, it's a story. So today, I thought I would try to tell a story for you that matches up with the story by our guest speaker. Now, who's got a bulletin here? What's today's sermon about? <laughs> um, we're going to tell a story about uh, relationships, okay? Ooh, that's a big word. Can you say that? relationships. Oh, that's a big word. Let's try, to, let's try to gear that down just a bit. We're going to tell a story about interactions. No, that's, no, that's not good either. We're going to talk about the dynamics. No, let's just talk about love. Is that okay? Can we just talk about love? Is that good? All right. This is a story from 1962. Oh, that was a good year. Oh, yeah. Just a few years ago. And um, it's a story about a gentleman named Robert Thompson. Now, in 1962, Robert Thompson was graduating from high school. Now, you have to understand about Robert, or Robbie, as his friends called him. <clears throat> Robbie came from a fairly wealthy family. Robbie enjoyed a lot of the benefits of um, living with a wealthy family in terms of having virtually all the things that he could possibly want. But sometime, Robbie had difficulty with, oh, here's that word again, relationships or interactions or the dynamics or even love with even the basics of people in his life like his mom and dad for instance some would say there was just no love there at all and Robbie wasn't your typical teenager he was stubborn and he would rebel and he would cause all kinds of challenges for mom and dad who indeed loved him dearly but just couldn't relate to the little Robbie. Now, Robbie, <clears throat> in his last year of school, was very, very concerned because he was fully expecting that on his 18th birthday, which coincided with his 12th grade graduation, he would be receiving the car of his dreams, which was a 1962 blue Corvette. He had it all picked out. He'd gone down to the store. He knew exactly which car he wanted. He didn't ask his parents for it. He told his parents that's what his gift was going to be. Newsflash, don't do this. Your parents do not like this kind of thing at all. And he actually <clears throat> was quite convinced that this was the gift that he was going to get. But Robbie became very concerned because in the last year of his high school, his parents started attending a church. And they would actually ask Robbie to come, and he would try to come. He'd try to make them happy. But he was very worried because every day he saw them studying the Bible, and they would go to Wednesday night prayer meeting, and then they would go to church every weekend, and he started getting concerned, thinking that, you know, mom and dad are starting to focus on a lot of different things in life. They don't focus so much on money anymore. They don't focus so much on their work anymore, and I'm really dreadfully worried they're not focusing so much on that blue Corvette anymore. Well, <clears throat> big graduation weekend came, and um, as often happened, Robbie got in a fight with his parents. Oh, this was a terrible fight. He stomped out of the house. He just said, I'm going to go take care of my own graduation. I don't care if you guys come or not. What hurtful words for a teenager to say to his parents. His parents, of course, came for graduation. And at the end of the service and the ceremony and all the things that happened, <clears throat> Robbie came home. 
And Robbie sat there in the dining room table, just kind of wondering what he was going to do next, waiting for his parents to come downstairs. He was already planning his life. He was going to go and move out on his own. He was a big kid now. And his parents came downstairs, and they presented to him their graduation gift. Robbie, of course, was hoping that the gift would be the blue 1962 Corvette, but he was disgusted, discouraged, and full of despair when instead his parents hand them this beautifully decorated wooden box. Curious, he opened the box, and inside, what did he find but a leather-bound Bible? Engraved on the front was his name, Robbie Robert Thompson, it was beautiful gold leaf, had a beautiful bookmark, and a little words on the front of the Bible that said, Robbie, because we love you, we think this is the greatest gift of all. Be sure to open and read every day. Robbie was angry. He took that box and threw it to the side of the dining room table and went over and crashed into the china cabinet, and he walked out of the house in disgust determined never, ever to see his parents again. In fact, Robbie got so discouraged, he put off all his plans for moving out and living in an apartment in town. In fact, he wanted to get as far away as possible. And so he said, I'm joining the army. And joining the army, he did. He sent a, we didn't have uh, cell phones and, and things like that. He sent a telegram to his parents that said, send for my things, pack a box, I'm going off to the military. And so his parents did as he asked, and they packed a box full of all of his clothes and things that he would need while he's in the military. Guess what else they remembered to put inside the trunk? Of course, the box, which had the Bible. So <clears throat> Robbie, who later grew up to be in the military, now called Robert, you know, would have to look in that trunk every once in a while, and he would see that Bible, and he would be so angry. He would just bring back all kinds of thoughts, how his parents had you know, uh, uh, um, hurt him and not done the right thing by giving him that blue 1962 Corvette. Five years passed, ten years passed, no Christmases, no Thanksgiving, no phone calls, no letters to his parents. He was determined to show them that he was angry for life. After he got out of the military, retired, he tried marriage, but found out that relationships interactions, all that dynamics, all that things called love was way too hard for him to do. Finally, when he was around 50 years old, he heard from others that his father had passed away and that his mother was very ill and would soon die as well. He thought <clears throat> perhaps he'd been stubborn and bitter long enough and decided to go back and visit his mom didn't know what he could do to or say to make up for all the lost years, but he thought the one thing that he could do to make her happy, the thing that would remind her of the time they had when they were young, when they were a good mother and son, was to bring home the box. And so he did. And there at the nursing home, he opened the box in front of his mom, and he decided for the first time in 50 years, maybe I should take my mom and dad's advice, and I should open this Bible. And he did it. And he started reading to his mom, and he cried. And his mom said, you got to look up a verse that talks about Jesus soon coming. It's in the back of the Bible, Robbie. And so he did. And as he opened up the back of the Bible, he saw a pair of keys a 1962 blue Corvette. Of course, the car was long gone now. Not ever again would he be able to have that relationship or that interaction or those important dynamics with dad because he'd passed. He lost his opportunity to love and share with his mom. Boys and girls, let me ask you this. Do you love your moms and dads? Good. Let me ask you this. Do you love Jesus? 
Now ask your mom and dad what I mean when I say this. Don't ever lose the keys to the 1962 blue Corvette. You can go back to your seats now. I'm going to call on uh, Grace Montgomery to come and share our scripture reading with us today. And uh, it's taken from Mark 3, verses 1 to 6. And she will share that. And then the uh, Russian-German ensemble will be sharing special music with us. Next time Jesus came into the meeting place, a man with a crippled hand was there. The, ph the Pharisees wanted to accuse Jesus of doing something wrong, and they kept watching to see if Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus told the man to stand up where everyone could see him. Then he asked, on the Sabbath, should we do good deeds or evil deeds? Should we save someone's life or destroy it? but no one said a word. Jesus was very angry as he looked around at the people, yet he felt sorry for them because they were so stubborn. Then he told the man, stretch out your hand. He did, and his bad hand was healed. The Pharisees left, and straight away they started making plans with, the, with Herod's followers to kill Jesus. Amen.
last night. They're, they're here sharing their stories with us. But I just have to tell you just a little bit more about them. They both uh, work at the univers and Andrews University. She's in the Department of Nursing. He is at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Uh, he's in the Department of Discipleship and Religious Education. And he is very much well-liked by the students there. As a matter of fact, I do recall, before you even spoke at the seminar this summer, you stood up and they were cheering. They want to hear from him. And together they have a ministry called Into His Rest. And it is in this capacity that they've come to visit us today to share their story with us and to help us on our journey with Jesus as well. So thank you for accepting the invitation to come to Henderson Highway. We're very pleased to have you here. Thank you, Christina, and thank you all for your warm welcome. We're really happy to be here and uh, just love to connect with people, God's precious people, and we're so glad, all of us are God's precious people, and we're so glad to be here. So let us go ahead and begin with prayer. Father, once again, we pray that you'd open our minds and hearts, so we might hear you, so we might uh, receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And Father, whatever needs to be done to remove barriers from what you want to say to us today, Lord, just take care of that for us. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. And it was the Sabbath. You know, whenever God tells us a story in Scripture... What he wants us to do is put ourselves into that story. Put ourselves into that story. Think of yourself, if you will. Put yourself in the place of, of this man with a deformed hand being at church. Okay? Being at church on the Sabbath. One of the challenges back in Jesus' day was that, was that when people had deformities of any kind, it was thought that this was a curse from God and somehow this man had sinned or his parents had sinned. And, and so they really looked down on people with any kind of defect or deformity. And so with that background, here this man is in church with this deformity, despised, not wanted, just tolerated, and Jesus says something to him. He said, Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. It's like, oh, really, Jesus? You want me to come up here? I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed anyway. I kind of sit in the back pew because people don't want to have much to do with me. And I'm kind of filled with all this shame about myself because I'm looked upon as this this man with sin. And Jesus says, come on up here. Stand in front of everybody. Wow. Had to take a lot of courage for that man to come up there, don't you think? To stand in front of everybody. He looked upon him as a man who there was something wrong with him. Can any of you guys relate to that man? Have any of you ever felt like me during the course of your life that really there's something wrong with you? You know, somehow you don't measure up. That when other people look at you, they really see that defect. You know, back in the day, back in the day, um, the beginning of, of human history, there were two people who really liked to walk with God and God liked to walk with them, but they blew it one day. And when they blew it, our first parents decided that they would hide, that they would hide from God. And they thought that they could be successful in hiding from God. But you know it didn't work very well, right? God came in pursuit of them and found them Adam, Eve, where are you? Well, you know what their response was. But I don't want to go into that story, but I want to say to you 
that that tendency to hide when we've done wrong, or that tendency to hide when we have deformities or defects, is something that all of us have been doing since our first parents' fall. All of us do that. All of us do that. And so I want to ask us, does that serve us well to hide? You know, Beverly and I do a lot of work with families, and we teach about families and healthy family functioning. And, and, and one of the things that we, that we know from our work with people and, and so forth is that in dysfunctional families, and, and I'd like to say even in dysfunctional church families, because we're family here at Henderson Highway, right? I mean, would you agree with that? We're, we're, we're family. But in families that are, are not healthy families, what happens is that, is that we don't want people to know our garbage. You feel me? We don't want people to know when we've done wrong. We, we want to kind of keep that secret. And in some family systems, particularly in various cultures, and boy, I really love all the various cultures here in this church. It's wonderful. But in some cultures, there's this thing about protecting the family so you know, people don't know the family business. Do some of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, we don't talk about what, what, what dad did or you know, with, with Uncle Sam, and we, we just don't talk about those things. We, we keep family secrets, and, and when one of the secrets is about something that's happened to me, like if I've been hurt by another family member and, and, and I can't talk about it with a safe person, the impact of that um, secret on the family is it keeps the family sick. So now talk about family secrets and secrets and families. This is a really, really important point that uh, uh, I mentioned last night that I am a, I love neuroscience because it helps me to understand um, theological concepts and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, how does that happen? If, you know, the worst says it happens, but scientifically, how does that happen? And uh, neuroscience has unlocked a lot of uh, those um, secrets for me and helped me to understand, and I love sharing that, uh, those, those uh, tidbits as, as I talk and as I teach. And one point that was just really fascinating to me is that when you keep a secret, it does more damage to you than the actual event itself. You want me to say that again? When you keep a secret, when you're hiding, but when you keep a secret, it does more damage than perhaps the actual event itself. For example, when uh, uh, people are molested or uh, abused, we know that one in three, uh, 3.5, three, three uh, women have been sexually abused. And we know now, we used to think the numbers were higher, one in seven, I'm sorry, lower, but they really are like one in four young people. By the time that they're 18, young men will have been sexually abused. And that's pretty significant. And oftentimes that information does not emerge until, sometimes until people are in their 20s or 25, 26, when it comes out that this indeed actually happened to me. And sometimes that's come out after uh, a lot of havoc has been wreaked in our lives and in our relationships. But what science has, had, neuroscience has determined today is that in fact, when you keep a secret, uh, particularly around trauma, it uh, has the ability to have to cause more damage than if you had talked about it initially. And so that, that's pretty significant. And one more part about this story, just um, uh, I, I, David said, imagine yourself as a man, but if you look at each one of the, the players in the story, Jesus, the Pharisees, and of course the man with the withered hand, as you sit and ponder and as you 
meditate. And this is what we do. We put ourselves in the storyline as we study and as we meditate on the story. What are you trying to say to me, Lord? How does this story speak to me? And um, it's interesting. There is, on any given day, I could be the men who were mad at Jesus. On any given day, I could be, and, and let me tell you what my anger looks like. What are you thinking? Why are you moving this way? What's up with that, Jesus? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Okay. Don't you want to kind of help God out? Try to kind of direct him a little bit and kind of, you know, orchestrate circumstances so he can move. And haven't you prayed so that you covered all the bases so you think when you pray to God and then he comes entirely a different way? What are you thinking? And we know in God's economy, uh, if it's good for one person, it's good for everybody. That's how he rolls. But we don't often see it that way. And so I, I have been those Pharisees and those uh, scribes, the people who knew the law, who struggle and, and have been angry with Jesus. And then there are times when I have been uh, the man with the withered hand and Jesus has put me on front street in front of everybody. And now, can you imagine that man walking in, walking into uh, the synagogue and walking in and, and he's really, as David suggests, he's trying to hide. And Jesus says, no, hey you, come on up here, come on down front. What would happen if Jesus did that today? Right here in Henderson Highway. Ooh-wee! <laughs> what if he said, I, I want you to get up and I want you to tell your church family uh, how to specifically pray for you. You've been struggling with overeating. You've been struggling with pornography. You've been struggling with shopping. I want you to get up. I want you to, to go to your elder and say, listen, I have a testimony. She said, wouldn't it be great this morning if we could have time where we could hear testimonies about what God is doing and how he's moving? And wouldn't it be something if you go to her and she, you say, listen, I got something to say. And she said, by all means, come on up and talk. Wouldn't it be something if one of you all were called to do that. Would you do it? You don't have to answer that for me, but you do have to answer that for yourself. Would you be willing to put your business out there on Front Street? I don't know about you, but I was raised in a household where you don't tell your business. You keep, what goes on in this house stays in this house. Anybody hear that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we call that like trying to teach our children boundaries. What we're really doing is teaching our children walls. Last night, Beverly and I took a few minutes to share some of our story with those of you who are here. We really appreciate um, that. And one of the one of the things about our story, by, by the way, we, we asked you, those of you who are here, we gave you an assignment, right? What was the assignment? To write your story. Okay. Any of you guys get a chance to start? Some of you did. Thinking about it, you know, thinking about your story. Maybe that's what kept you up, Carolyn. Yeah. And during the night, it's like, ooh, 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 trying to put some of this together. But, but, but I have a fundamental question then about our stories, and that is this. Um, okay, is is it safe here at Henderson Highway to to tell your story? Is this a safe church? Now, how many times, for example, um, when, remember Beverly talked about sitting in the pew, thinking about killing yourself? And this is part of her story last night. You know, Wednesday night prayer meeting. You guys have Wednesday night prayer meeting here? The prayer meeting? Okay. How many people get up and are just honest and authentic? and say, you know, pray for me because I am struggling with this particular problem. 
Or do we just do kind of, you know, the generic prayer thing that we do? You know, so-and-so is sick, and, you know, and so-and-so has financial problems, and, you know, we have our generic Adventist things that we talk to God about. This is the best one. Uh, I have an unspoken request. Yeah, really. And so, uh, Lord, I want you to help Sister in her unspoken request. Really? But you know, we'll do that, if I don't tell you who I am, how are you going to know how to pray for me? How are you going to really know specifically how to pray for me? And if I don't, you know, if we're not transparent with one another, then what happens to intimacy? Can you really be close? I'm not talking about sexual intimacy here. I'm talking about into me see, into me you see. You know, that kind of intimacy, you know, is God's family meant to be a family where people know each other? Are we meant to be a, a group of people where we really know each other well? Or we, are we satisfied here in this church with just doing the happy Sabbath thing? You know, smiling, greeting, no, oh, you know, but still hiding. Hiding behind the smile. I, I want to take it even uh, closer to home, David. Uh, we, we, we talk about church, but uh, I asked a very important question last night, and I want to ask this question uh, this, this, this afternoon, if I could, and that is, does David look like a white man who'd be interested in a black woman? Why are you laughing? <laughs> I mean, he is just so straight legs looking and, you know, so in the box. And, he went, and so when I discovered that he was interested in me, I was like, no, you know. But anyway, uh, it was clear that God put us together. Uh, God said to me on the second date, this is the man I had for you. I stopped talking to David and started arguing with God because I wanted a dark-skinned, chunky black man. That was the prototype. And so I got that. What, what are you thinking here, God? And, um, and so we get married clear. It was clear God had orchestrated everything. We get married, and, and um, six weeks into our marriage, um, we discover I'm pregnant. And we have this little boy. I'm home with uh, Grace and Michael. But I am, I mean, I'm so in love with my husband. I'm, it's so great. He's just a, he, and how he is in, in the classroom, or as you see him out and about, that's how he is at home. He treats me wonderful for the most part. But no, he treats me, he treats me wonderful. <laughs> um, and so imagine my um, anxiety when I started dreaming about being married to a black man. And so it was a recurring dream. I'd have it every six weeks, every two months, months, and I'm like, I mean, I'm in the midst in this deep, wonderful dream. I'm just very happy. And I roll over, and I don't want to wake up, but I roll over, and it's him. And I'm like, oh, it's you. <laughs> These dreams are coming. It was pretty regular. And I'm what is going on here, Lord? I, I've been serving the Lord and really got acquainted with him enough to know that how, I feel, how we feel about dreams is really where the rubber meets the road. However crazy the dream may be, pay attention to how you feel. And so when I wake up and I would just be so happy and be so disappointed that I woke up to him, I'm just distressed. And finally, the Lord told me this. Talk to David. I said, absolutely not. I am not going to talk. We've only been in like two and a half, three years. I'm not going to tell him I'm dreaming about being married to a black man. I'm just kidding. Absolutely not. And so the dreams kept coming, and I was just so distressed by these dreams. 
And finally, I got the courage up because we had made a uh, commitment to one another that there would be no secrets. We had made a decision that we wanted to be intimate. We wanted, even if it hurt, we wanted to know how the other was feeling. That's a huge risk to take. And let me do a disclaimer right now. Both of us are counselors. Both of us are trained in terms of, you know, all of this emotional uh, stuff and God has had us on a journey. And so when I tell you about David's response, women have said to me, both men and women, actually like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do that. Oh, my, uh, you know, women have said, my husband came and told me that I killed him. And, um, you know, just because we don't know our value and our worth. That's the truth. We don't know how loved and how special we are to God. We don't, we know it left brain, not right brain. We talked about that last night and perhaps we can weave some more of that in as we go uh, throughout our, our, our seminar this afternoon. But anyway, I got the courage up to talk to David. And uh, guess what? He had the insight. He, I, I had an aunt who had been um, dating a white man for several years, had a couple of children by him, and he took her out of the projects, set her up in the beautiful suburbs of Cleveland, and just really took good care of her. And her status in the family changed. She was the power broker. And her status had changed. And in, my father told me when I was 28, uh, that I was only damaged goods and I would never get married. Uh, I mentioned last night as part of my story, I got pregnant at 13 and a half and had a baby at 14. And so I'm 28 and my son is 14. And my dad said, you know, you're, you're never gonna get married. Uh, and so dad says you're damaged goods. So it must be so. As it turned out, um, I meet David and he's just a nice man. He, is just a sweetheart and just everything I wanted, just in the wrong package, but you know, everything I wanted. And so, um, but what happened was my status didn't change in the family. David now has come in the family. He is the one that the family members love. You know, they just, they, my mother said to me yesterday, uh, tell David I love him. What about me, mother? Tell David I love him. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, he's got the juice in the family. If there's a crisis going on, we can, everybody wants to talk to David. He can settle people down, and it's just a wonderful thing. My status didn't change in the family, and so now, this is all the insight that David is telling me. My, my status hadn't changed, but um, wow, God was trying to show me the lies that I believed about myself. That, you know, if my, my thinking was, my heart was, if I, if I, so I proved my daddy wrong, I got married, I married an educated white man, now if only I could marry an educated black man, then maybe my status would change. And now, I didn't know that to articulate that, but in my dreams, the dream kept coming up, and there the truth was. And so David said, well, yes, I'm hurt by this revelation, but it's no mystery. I can understand why the devastation of, of what has happened to you and your family, it makes perfect sense. And so that was really a great relief to me and it really caused me to, to realize that I've got to keep my heart open to my husband because he's the one that has the answer. And so we got here because we were talking about the notion that, wow, is this a safe church? I want to suggest to you that if the truth be told, we don't even have close relationships outside of the church. Let me ask a question and then I'm going to toss it back to you. How many of you all, you ladies, shop when you pull out those clothes and you say, oh, there's old dress when your husband notices something new? 
Oh, this old thing. Oh, I've had this for a minute. You know the line. Or my mother said, you know, you can't tell a man everything. You always got to keep something to the side. You, you know that call. You got to hold that to the side. Can't tell him everything. Why not? Into me, you see. And so safety here, safety in your marriage is extremely important. I mean, for, for the baptism, you read this wonderful Psalms you know, 91 about being sheltered in the, in the arms of God. You know, Caesar, thank you for that. And I, I love that Psalm myself. It, this, this sheltering in the arms of God is what makes it safe is what makes it absolutely safe for us. And I know my safety as a man, when I find other women attractive, is in Beverly, is in telling Beverly. And to do that, you have to have a secure relationship, yes? You have to have a secure relationship. And again, we've agreed to that. And so, you know, we talk with each other about these vulnerable things because we have grown in our journey with God and with one another to make it safe for us to talk about it, to be transparent and authentic with those kinds of things with one another. I know our time is over and I, we don't want to keep you too much longer, but, but I, do want to, I do want to challenge Henderson Highway. How can we make this church a safe church for people to be real. You know, one of the most healing things, and I'm just going to close with this little bit of this story. There was a study done uh, a few years ago called the Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACE Study. And in this study, they studied children who had been hurt in various ways throughout their childhood. And what they found is that children who, who had been hurt, who had experienced these adverse childhood experiences, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, absent parent, parent in jail, I mean, just they studied a number of things. The children who had experienced these things engaged in self-destructive physical behaviors. They didn't take care of themselves, drank alcohol, smoked, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, all these different kind of risk factors, as well as emotional things higher rates of suicide, depression, those kinds of things, okay? Just because of their history. But what they found is this, that when they shared their story with a safe person, which we call an empathic witness, someone who would listen, someone who wouldn't, who wouldn't give you a lecture, someone who wouldn't you know, condemn you because of what happened or would shame you or say, oh, that was so awful. Someone who would embrace you for just a half hour. If you shared your story for a half hour, it gave a year's worth of benefit. Okay? So when we talk about sharing stories, can we do this in a safe place? Now, I'm not talking about everyone getting up and telling everything to everybody. You know, there are parameters of safety that need to be understood. You know, maybe safe groups, support groups like, like Adventist Recovery Ministries or, you know, 12 step group. I, I'm hoping you guys have those kind of things here. Maybe, maybe a first step would be to try and institute those kind of things here to create safe places where there is anonymity, where there are rules of confidentiality. You know, that people know that if I share this, you know, it's not going to go anywhere else. You know, Building those kinds of things intentionally into the church will move the church toward health. Will move the church toward that place where God wants us to be. And in the process of sharing myself and being open with someone else, another safe person, I am then also more open with God. How many of us would like this church to be that way? To move in that direction some? Huh? So, so let's go ahead and just close with prayer and ask God to lead us in that direction, okay? Father in heaven, we're so grateful that, that you're here and that, Father, you are moving us toward, toward
toward help. You're moving us toward yourself, in fact. And so, Lord, just open our minds and open our hearts. Give us courage, Lord. We've been hiding far too long. Give us courage to be open, courage to be transparent, and, Lord, courage to heal. We thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before our, our closing song, I just want to say to you this, that this afternoon, we're going to have two seminars, one at 2 o'clock, and at 2 o'clock, I'm going to be talking with the adults. Bev's going to be taking the young people and working with them, and we're going to be talking about sex. Well, we're going to be talking about sexual intimacy, and that's not only having sex. There's a whole lot more to sexual intimacy than just having physical relations with one another. But we're going to explore that. We're going to explore that because that's such a big part of who we are. And then after that, we'll probably take just a few minute break, and then, and then we're going to all gather together, and we're going to talk about forgiveness in relationships and how important that is to, to healthy and healing relationships. So that's the, the agenda for this afternoon. I really hope that as many of you as can will come back and be a part of the conversation because it is going to be a conversation. We're not going to just give you sermons or lectures. We're going to have interactions with you and, and really talk and, and do this together, okay? So let's go ahead and have our, our closing prayer. <laughs> made it safe for the man with the withered hand. And just so, your presence and your invitation will make it safe for us to come, to stretch out our withered hands, to stretch out whatever area of brokenness we have, and to hear you say, be healed. Thank you, Lord, that you have each of us on a healing journey. 
Thank you that you've taken us one step closer on the journey towards yourself today. Lord, we love you for it, and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.